Okay, it's 10.03. We're, we're going to start now. Um, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first of the DFI International Grouting Committee webinar series. Our subject matter today is jet grouting. My name is Kathleen Bensko. I am the senior geologist with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission out of Washington, D.C. office. I am co-chair of the DFI International Grouting Committee, along with Raffaella Granata with Treviaicos out of Italy. Um, so we welcome you and we hope that you enjoy our webinar today. So we're going to go over a little, a few of the rules of engagement. Uh, during the webinar, all attendees will be muted. We will have a Q&A that will, will follow the last presentation. So instead of taking questions as we go, we'll wait until the very end. When you, um, there's a Q&A box, please write your question in that box. And if you are directing it at a specific speaker, please clarify that in your question. And uh, if you have a question, um, as I said, please use that box. Okay. So our speakers today will be Dennis, W. Bame uh, from Keller. He will presenting on jet grouting, design, and quality control. Paolo Gazzarini from Sea to Sky Geotech, who will be presenting jet grouting field trials. And Lorenzo uh, Fiotti, he is from Treviaicos, and he will be presenting on jet grouting applications and case histories. So now I will turn it over to Dennis. Thank you, Kathleen, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope that uh, wherever you're watching us from, uh, if you've suffered any damage, as I did during this storm barrel, uh, your families are safe and, and everything is going well. So let's go ahead and get into it. So I'm going to cover uh, design and quality control of jack routing and uh, overlap a little bit with um, with Apollo and Lorenzo's uh, slides as well. So um, you know, I can remember back when I did my first jack routing job was uh, back in 1992. So um, let's go ahead and, and get going here. So, so the agenda for my part of the presentation, we'll go through a little bit of an introduction. Not sure, you know, how much uh, the attendees uh, know about jack routing. So we'll talk about some principles there, and we'll talk about design different different way we design things for applications. Discuss a little bit about parameters and then and then quality control. And then, uh, like Kathleen said, Q&A at the very end of all of our slides. So I think it's important for us to know where jack routing fits in with other grouting techniques that uh, we may be uh, familiar with. So jack routing, uh, since it's an erosional based grouting technique, does offer the widest range of application. You can see here. Uh, we go all the way into clays and we stop short of cobbles because, you know, we 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 need column integrity at the end of the day. And if we're in cobble environment, chances are we can lose the integrity of the column. So so cobbles, you know, those kind of formations are 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 you know treated with other other forms of grouting that Kathleen's uh, grouting committee would be more than happy to help you out with. OK, so jet grouting introduction. Right. So. I kind of touched on the fact that, uh, you know, jet grouting is an erosional based grouting technique. You can see here the graphic running on the right hand side. We use a we use a high velocity, typically a, a slurry grout jet that uh, is uh, exits the drill string 90 degrees uh, from the drill string. And then we rotate the drill string and pull it back out of the ground. Typically, uh, jet grouting is a bottom up technique. And then based on how fast we spin that rod and how fast we pull it out of the ground, we can affect different column diameters by applying higher and lower erosion energies. So the other thing that affects the column diameters, the type of soil that we're in, right? So you can see the graphic here, to the bottom right, or bottom left, that, you know, clays, highly plastic clays are less erodible than, of course, clean sands. And so couple of things to remember as we go through the other aspects of, of the design process and what jet routing is all about. A couple of definitions for us today. The soilcrete, so you'll hear soilcrete word be used quite a bit during the presentation. It's basically the product of jet routing. So it's the blended 
you know, byproduct or the finished product that we have of the binder slurry that we're using and the in situ soil, right? And so the amount of soil that's left behind after the process is really related to, you know, some specifics about the uh, the specific gravity of the slurry we're using and the soil itself. The monitor is the really the heart and soul of the process. So it's that it's that device at the bottom of our drill string that takes all of those fluids that we're sending down the drill string and makes them exit 90 degrees. And it's used, you know, typically there's different nozzle sizes in there that help us, you know, focus that erosion energy at the soil we're trying to mix. And then spoil, right? So you'll hear us use the word spoil a lot today. That is the mixture of soil and binder slurry that returns to the surface during the process, right? I always like to tell people when jet grouting, volume in equals volume out, because if it doesn't, you're going to end up with heave. And that's the last thing we want to do, especially if we're underpinning a structure. And you'll see bottom right here, we got a picture of, uh, you know, a crew working down in a pit uh, doing jet grouting. And so spoil control is really paramount. And, uh, and Lorenzo will touch on that quite a bit during his process. So, so something about jet grouting design. So jet routing typically uses, you know, cement as the binder that we're that we're using uh, during the process. And so I thought it would be very interesting uh, for people to see the results of where jet routing falls in 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 the range of other techniques that we are very familiar with in the foundation industry. You know, as far as the carbon footprint or the amount of embodied carbon during the during the use of the product. So. Jet routing I've highlighted here basically falls about in the middle of the scale. So as practitioners, if we want to reduce our carbon footprint, which is which is paramount uh, importance here, uh, you know we need to look at different sort of uh, different binders that have low uh, lower demand on carbon to use in the process. So so something to think about the FC DFI carbon calculator is a great thing to use for this process, and uh, I, and I encourage everybody to start applying it to to their to their projects okay so what are the applications right the design changes a little bit based on the application you can see here you know check routing is used for you know scour protection like we show in the graphic it's used for underpinning and excavation support it's used to create bottom seals before an excavation is made um, we can use it for um, you know shaft support although you know, secant piles and some other things typically are done for the perimeter of the shaft. Jack routing is certainly used as a bottom seal in the base of that shaft before the excavation is made. And then sometimes we'll just use it to underpin a structure for additional load capacity, right? It, it works great for that. We've we've seen many applications over the years of that. And then, you know, last couple of applications here, water, water control or groundwater cutoff, and then just ground modification for say safe haven for tunneling okay so we touched on you know cement and the volume and erosion and all these kinds of things you know it basically you know the 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 soil creep that's there is a component of the binder or the cement we're using during the process the water that we're using in the binder slurry plus the groundwater and the soil that's in place right so soil you know takes up anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of this volume so so the existing soil has a big impact on the strength that we can get. You can see, you can see a typical uh, ranges for different soil types and different binder uh, or different cement contents and the strengths that we expect to get. So, so sands and gravels are going to give you the highest strengths and clays and these cohesive materials will give you lower strength. You know, so if you're in clays, you, you want to design strength probably in the 200 PSI max range. Just to kind of give you an idea what that looks like. OK, how do we determine, you know, these strengths that we can come up with? You know, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll do some early bench scale testing. We'll grab we'll grab samples of soil from the site and then we'll run that through a mixed design. We'll break that some, that soil down. We'll run, you know, classification test on it. We'll mix it with cement or our binder slurry to form to form soil crete. And then we'll cast that soil crete into samples and assess the age. The strength of those uh, samples, 3, 7, 14, 28, 56, perhaps, you know, proper curing of those samples. And then when we test these samples, we want to test them running the 
you know, applicable ASTM testing for low strength uh, soil cement mixtures, right? Which has a different loading rate than we use for typical concrete cylinders. So I just I just want to make sure everybody understands that, right? So we don't we don't run the standard ASTM concrete cylinder testing on soil creek samples. And then we plot these, you know, we plot these strengths and then we we apply those strength uh, values back into our design and see what kind of internal stresses the soil creek's able to withstand. So I've thrown up here a classic uh, example. So this is a excavation support and a bottom seal that we're going to do with jet routing. So you can imagine all the forces that are going to act on that. So we've got, you know, some horizontal earth pressures that we got to consider. We also have water pressure or buoyant forces acting upon the soil creep body. So we've got to take both buoyant force and, and, and you know, the groundwater force into the side. Uh, if we're creating a bottom seal or if we have some good soils that we're terminating in, we can pick up a fairly good passive resistance uh, component to the design. And then we have to evaluate the effects of surcharge. You know, if it's an excavation support system, we may have a crane or something you know, parked fairly close to the edge of the excavation. We want to make sure we take all that into consideration. So last two, two things we've got to do here, Lorenzo is going to touch a little bit on this last one, but we also have to look at the exposure time of the soil creek and its expected water tightness, because those two things have a tremendous impact on both the amount of cement binders we use and how we treat the geometry and testing for the in place geometry to ensure water tightness before the excavation is made. You know, if we're doing a bottom seal, you know, not only do we have to look at buoyant forces, we have to have extremely good quality soil creek that we've cast, you know, from, from, you know, from before the excavation is made. So here's an example where we're using a tie down anchor of some, some sort to help, um, you know, help, uh, you know, minimize the thickness of that soil creek, uh, soilcrete slab that's put in place. A lot of times you can play with the depth of it so you can start to balance overburden pressures and those kinds of things to sort of like, uh, you know, do an economy design for uh, the thickness of this uh, soilcrete slab. But, you know, tie downs are a, a great way to a great way to do that. Here we're using the auger cast piles. In this example, we're using uh, some pre-placed uh, driven uh, Precast piles that we did the jack routing around. And so, you know, that gives us a really good, really good uh, solution there. The other thing, when we're applying jack routing for a basal seal, like on these two examples, that changes the, that changes the loading of the excavation support and typically will reduce the moment and, and those kinds of things. So a lot of times this is a 26 foot deep excavation here shown in this picture, very soft plays around the perimeter. And we're handling that with one row of bracing at the very, very top of the excavation. So really, really interesting uh, solution there. In past couple of years, we've also created uh, bond zones. So we've put bond zones in place for both micropiles and anchors. You can see the effects here between the conventional anchors, even with post grouting. When we compare that to um, to a jet grouted bond zone, we get much higher uh, strength, much higher capacities and lower creep values. This is this is really important if we're dealing with, you know, sites that are really soft materials and we just we just can't get, you know, an anchor to work in those materials. Jet routing might provide a great opportunity for you to do that. There's been several case histories done around the world to do this. Underpinning, so this is a classic use of uh, of excavation support for using soil creek uh, jet routing you know, direct underpinning of an existing structure like we're showing on the left-hand side, and then some temporary underpinning uh, using some temporary columns. You can see with this column, I really like this picture, and this is from the underside of uh, George Bush Intercontinental Airport, if you've ever been through that airport uh, many years ago, some jack rock columns were used to temporary support a floor. You can see the effects on the column diameter of the different uh, layers of strength of material in that project. Classic underpinning design. So we're we're putting the body of soil creed in. You can see here we're using a perpendicular column that sits directly under the footing, and then we're using an inclined column behind that. And that inclined column really helps us out with overturning, right? We're picking up all the weight of the soil. 
there on top of that column in our design. And so these other forces we we, courted, we discussed. And so the classic thing is we we allow this to be done from, from before the excavation's made, right? And then the excavation is made. So in recent years, we've started to use the system for underpinning storage tanks. Here we're doing the outside and then we go and we do the inside. And so the parameters that we're using for jet grouting, right? So we talked about column diameters and these kinds of things. They they really depend on these things. So what are we using for the erosion medium? And then what are we doing for rotation and pool speeds? We have three different systems to choose from. So single fluid, double fluid, and triple fluid. Lorenzo will talk about those a little bit. The other piece of the erosion calculation is the sort of the quality of our, our nozzles that we're using. And so I've thrown up here some, some, some you know, typical column sizes, depending on the strength of the materials that you might see. So something good for you guys to think about. Um, you know, we can produce up to seven meter diameter columns if we get our tooling right and our, and our erosion energy is correct. And then since it's a circular based system, you know, we have uh, the capacity to create all kinds of like uh, circular geometries, even elliptical sort of uh, size things. And Lorenzo will touch on that quite a bit. All right. So lastly, QAQC. So once the material is in the ground, how do we test it? Well, there's two ways to test it, right? So we can either take a wet grab sample of that soil creek, or we can wait till the material hardens and do a core sampling of it, which, you know, is core sampling, regardless of what anybody tells you, is a destructive testing mechanism. And so it's, it's quite subjective in many cases. And so a camera really helps out to view that core hole after it's been done. But the coring, so what do you want to do with the coring? You typically want to core overlap locations or these interstice locations to really evaluate that diameter of the column you're creating. If you can exhume these columns and look at them, I really prefer that that gets done that way. Uh, a lot of times if we're below the water table, it might not allow us to do that. And so in recent years, acoustical systems have been developed. Um, here's one that... Uh, we have at our company, so we put down some rods and we put some geophones on those rods, and then we do the jet route test column. And so, you know, one rod is placed outside the diameter that we think to create, and one's placed just inside the diameter. And so we time we time the listening device when when the erosion jet is pointed at those columns and make sure we pick that acoustical vibration up and we adjust the speed and rotation of the drill rig to connect and disconnect. So really good way to really good way to check that out, right? And so, but no matter how good of a job we do, there's still always a skeptic out there and they prefer to look at it themselves. So, you know, every once in a while we get that person that just wants to get a, a personal view of what we've done in the ground. And so this is a typical way to get that done, right? And so with that, I enjoy uh, enjoy the webinar, the rest of the webinar. Thank you for your attention. Now I'll pass it over to Paolo. Okay. Here I am. So uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I will, uh, I'm a consultant. So I will try to do. Okay. Uh, I have some delay. Uh, I would like to talk uh, um, as a consultant about the um, field test. And uh, uh, I would like to 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 show this couple of documents very important. One uh, is the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers Geo Institute, the um, specification guideline specification that we prepare in uh, around the 2008 2009, and was updated in uh, 2016. So these are the geographic specification of the um, American Society of Civil Engineers Geo Institute. Uh, in this uh, in this document, uh, um, the field test uh, um, is quite um, well defined. I will say there is one first part related to the submittal, the submittal, and uh, um, you can see here uh, there is one part in italic with some comment that I found quite interesting. Uh, there is also uh, in the execution, there is a lot of uh, description of, of how, in theory, should be done the field test. The other important document is the um, European uh, code, 
um, where there is uh, defined in the preliminary field test, uh, in theory, what is and what should be. Why we do the uh, field test? Of course, we need to verify the diameter target. We need to define the uh, gerglouting, the type of gerglouting and the parameter value. Uh, sometimes we need to define the procedure. Um, so fresh on fresh or, or in different ways. And later we need to verify the final product depending on the target. So a compressive trend, a permeability or whatever. The grout miscomposition. Uh, Danny was talking about um, slurry. Yes, slurry can be water cement. Uh, we can add bentonite. Uh, typically, the, the grout mix can be between 0.8 to 1.2, depending from the contractor. And there are also uh, some other um, parameters that can be tested during this field flight. So uh, definitely, the field test is absolutely super important. And I should say is mandatory. It's mandatory with uh, the exception if, uh, for example, here in Vancouver, uh, we do a lot of uh, gerglouting job in area very close where the, we know the type of soil, we know the parameter used before. In this specific case, um, we can avoid to do the gerglouting, but must be clear that always the responsibility is the control of the contractor. So the contractor can decide, no, guys, I have already experience in this in this soil. We can avoid to do the, 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 the field test. Okay, is not a problem. Unless there is a, also a, a, an agreement between the in contractor, the owner, and, and the, 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 that uh, the field test uh, can be avoided, especially if it's an urgent job, emergency job, that sometimes uh, um, require, especially the, the main contractor, sometimes need a uh, hurry, 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 hurry. But this must be clear that uh, at the beginning that there is an agreement that the field test cannot be done. Uh, so once the field test has been done, the parameter and the procedure, the grout mix, and all this should be, must remain constant, absolutely. And if something happened, uh, some different soil condition that we can see during the drilling, the changes must be um, agreed and must be discussed with all the parties involved. So the owner, the engineer, etc. Uh, in a recent case here in Vancouver, I arrived late at the job, uh, so I couldn't do anything at the beginning, but we discovered that the contractor uh, without knowing the reason, change completely the parameter used without knowing the reason. So this is, in my opinion, and again, from the engineering point of view, from the consultant point of view, cannot be absolutely accepted. Typically, as Danny was saying, we do uh, three uh, columns theoretically overlapping. Uh, we can do two, three clusters um, with uh, aggressive parameter, conservative parameter, or maybe we can change type of mixing depending from the condition. And we do typically, as you, uh, you saw in, in, in the better <laughs> slide of, of Dennis, we do the coring uh, in the critical point. Some people do also maybe 80% of the radius or something like that. And definitely the measuring is, is the excavation of the column is the best. Coring, definitely. I prefer personally PQ uh, if it's possible, but each coup can be acceptable, camera inspection, and if necessary, um, water pressure test. Hopla. Oh, yeah. So uh, other methods of measuring the column diameter. So there is that direct method, as we did, so the excavation, the coring, mechanical caper, calipers, has been used and are using today. Painted rod I use, but I don't like very much. And later as there are some indirect methods, the thermal, geophone, sonic wave, electric resistivity, all this system still in a development phase. But I would like to touch one moment the, calip the mechanical calipers, because uh, I use personally um, this uh, mechanical, but this is an old job. 
old job uh, in uh, probably 15 years ago and uh, <clears throat> it was a sort of um, acceptable but not uh, not uh, super super uh, super good we say with a dynamometer to see when the <clears throat> the arm of the of the caliper they open but uh, I started to do jet grouting in 1981, so 40, 42, 43 years ago, a long time. And in our industry, thanks God, there is a huge evolution. Every every year, there are people dedicated to research and development of a new system. So in the mechanical caliper, recently uh, came out one very interesting, in my opinion, very promising um, caliper. Uh, hydraulic, very, very uh, instrumented, uh, definitely that they like, a, a last generation. Um, so this is uh, used by some colleague of mine that they were quite uh, enthusiastic about this system. And I hope this uh, can have a future because uh, I think uh, um, this is, can solve a lot of problems in the, uh, in the jet grouting industry. Uh, so, uh, we have a lot of uh, um, measuring system indirect, so as we saw, uh, as we talked before, and uh, mm, a lot of these are proprietary. So the contractor and I thank them for for the to to, to develop this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, new procedure, new technique. But the main question for us is: uh, Can the controller? be the controller is not the case to have some independent system that uh, uh, used by all the contractor all the industry i don't say one or several of these so i think this uh, topic uh, uh, catherine and then um, rafaela maybe in the in the international grouting committee we can maybe a create a sort of uh, a, a task group to discuss this. Uh, this uh, not that I don't believe that uh, the contractor uh, do something. Uh, no, this is not this the point. The point is we need to have one system uh, um, approved or approved or agreed by the industry um, that is possible to use to eliminate this kind of. Uh, Point. And I would like to to do one uh, um, one case history of a of the grouting field test that I think is quite interesting. And this was a was an old job 15, 16 years ago probably in the um, Vancouver Island West Coast in a dam in a dam that is located three three kilometer north of the city of Campbell River. And the uh, local uh, um, power utility, BC Hydro, decided that they, they need a cutoff wall, an uh, interim cutoff wall, in case of uh, a seismic event. So it was, uh, they decided to do with jet grouting, um, cut off. Uh, um, we in Vancouver, we don't have in British Columbia, we don't have a lot of possibility to do a conventional cutoff with grab or something like that. So they decided to do with jet grouting based also on the experience that they had uh, in a previous job in the same dam. So they decided to do an early contractor involvement, and the um, the target, of course, was study and discussion with uh, joint with the uh, a contractor, engineer, everybody, with uh, the target to avoid hydrofracturing and hydrojacking in the dam. So uh, we need to understand that uh, if we do a, a, a gel grouting job in a dam embankment, the risk is huge. And as Danny was saying, the spoil, the control of the reflow is absolutely fundamental to avoid this kind of uh, um, problem. So, um, study of the, of the procedure and definition to be verified in a field test. So it was a very, very uh, long and, and difficult uh, 
difficult, difficult. It was a long process, discussion the the the, the, the procedure, um, and verify the uh, in a field test that the proposed uh, methodology was uh, um, correct to avoid the hydro fracturing and hydro jacking of the dam. The soil was a perfect soil for degrouting, so sand overlying some um, very, very, uh, not very deep um, silt and clay to arrive to the broken rock uh, at the bottom. So the methodology was, uh, of course, uh, in a dam, we cannot use absolutely air that can uh, create a, a lot of problems. So definitely the, the main the main point is we decide absolutely single geographic. With the single geographic, sometimes we have problem in the having the reflow coming to surface that is very important uh, for the uh, control of the geographic. So we decided to pre-drill 200 millimeter diameter hole with a Sony drill rig to try to disturb as less as possible the uh, embankment installing a 150 millimeter diameter PVC casing, remove the sonic casing, the steel sonic casing, we measure the uh, alignment of the uh, uh, of the hole, and commands, commands start the gel grouting with a single gel grouting with no air. So practically, installation of the uh, steel casing with a sonic drilling, minimal amount of water, minimal amount of water to avoid disturbance of the soil, installation of the 150 millimeter diameter PVC pipe, remove the steel casing, measure the verticality, inserting the jet grouting tool and jetting from the bottom our column. So uh, let's go, I, uh, only five minutes, so let's go a little bit faster. Um, field test area in a different location, of course, than the production area, <laughs> similar soil condition, but in an area that if some hydro fracturing and hydro jacking happen, this uh, doesn't create problem to the dam. And with the consequent damage of the dam, with a, a, a city of 20,000 people living downstream. Now, uh, to complicate a little bit of the, uh, the thing, that is the, the owner decided to use uh, not a conventional simple grout mix, uh, uh, water cement, 0 0.8, 1.2, but they want to add bentonite to have more plastic, a final treated soil, um, of course, to increase the ductility of the of the material and to have uh, uh, that in case of seismic uh, event. And the quantity of bentonite was defined as maximum, defined on the pumpability of the requirement. So what we did, we did in this case, we didn't do a cluster, but we do two single two cluster of two columns. Let's say we did a couple of columns to see and to verify that the jerk routing was able to destroy the PVC, we installed <clears throat> few um, piezometer, wireless piezometer, to see the effect of the jetting. And uh, uh, we did also additional um, sonic uh, uh, coring in proximity of the column to see that uh, um, the grout was not present, so didn't migrate, didn't migrate, and didn't create uh, hydrojacking, hydrofracturing more than hydrojacking. So uh, <clears throat> this is a picture of the piezo of the inst piezometer installation and the PVC casing, and this is, was verified that <clears throat> the jet that uh, typically at the nozzle has a speed of 800, 900 kilometer per hour destroy perfectly the PVC casing and uh, was able to create the color. Uh, verticality, with, uh, we can do with uh, several ways. 
position of the of the of the hole at the bottom. And this is the result of the uh, verticality uh, measurement. We have a deviation of uh, 0.73 percent. Quite quite good, of course, because the casing rigid is uh, quite uh, and can give a very good result. And we had the possibility to do the excavation only a couple of meters uh, because there was a water table and was not was not possible to to go uh, deeper, of course. Uh, perfectly round uh, uh, top of the column, perfect soil, sand. So it was an excellent, excellent result. Real time control. So <clears throat> this was our Cape Canaveral uh, control room. Uh, we had one person full time uh, engaged there. And he can see in the two screen uh, the uh, piezometer reading in real time at the same time that the Jet grouting execution. Okay, this is not. Uh, this is the parameter of the jet grouting in real time in a screen in the in the in the in the in Canaveral. And here we, we are able to uh, graphic the um, the behavior of the pore pressure. We can see that during the jetting, the pore pressure increases at one certain distance. You can see later in the presentation when uh, with more time. But later, the dissipation of the pressure was quite uh, very, very, very quick, saying that we didn't damage in any case the, the soil. So we, we the data collect was absolutely, absolutely important and super super important. So this uh, early contractor involvement process was very important and the field trial provide invaluable information to give us the green light to execute the um, the job and the job was completed without any damage and the city of Camp Libre is still there. <laughs> so it's good. Uh, I finish with the grout line. Groutline.com is a part in the DFI in the DFI uh, web page. And uh, I pass my baton to Lorenzo in our relay jet grouting presentation. Thank you. And uh, if you have a question, uh, you can uh, shoot me later, one email, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Um, so in this last presentation, uh, we will uh, go through some uh, possible zygotic application and uh, as well as some case histories. Um, so as said, we will recall some of the concepts that have been uh, presented by Dennis and Paolo and uh, trying to apply uh, them to some real case uh, history. So we will uh, see an overview of the possible zygotic applications uh, and then we will uh, see also the typical site layout for the zagrouting operation. We also touch base on uh, an important aspect, which is the spoil management, uh, already discussed previously, but we will expand a little bit on that. And finally, we will see some uh, uh, case histories, two of them in the US and one in Europe, in Norway. Uh, so we will see some double fluid as well as triple fluid, uh, some elliptical shapes. So uh, I try to pull out uh, some interesting challenges from each one of these projects. Uh, so going a little fast on this, uh, as I've been explained before. Uh, so with the Zegrao team, we can create uh, some different shapes. Of course, the most typical one is the cylinder. So we have a constant. Uh, rotation speed uh, with the withdrawal. Uh, we can also modulate uh, the rotational speed in different sectors of the column to create different shapes, like uh, the one here in the picture is an elliptical shape. So uh, we can kind of create different uh, shapes. Uh, by combining the elements, then we can uh, create the structure that we need. And talking about application without uh, going into the detail of each single one, uh, we can uh, uh, collect them in some uh, main uh, uh, 
the groups uh, of applications. So the first one, of course, is the strengthening, is the gun improvement in itself. So uh, we try to improve the uh, strength and stiffness properties of the soil. Uh, for some other type of application, for example, uh, for cattle walls or bottom plaques, uh, the water tightness is a requirement as well. So this will fall under uh, the other category of the water tightness. And then finally, we have, uh, which I like to keep it as a separate category, the tunneling application. So here on the right, you can see a typical uh, break in, break out uh, block, uh, which is uh, constructed with the Z routing. Or uh, we can also treat, uh, uh, like the picture on the on the left, uh, the ring of soil surrounding the tunnel excavation, and we will see an example in the in the case histories. Uh, jumping into the site logistics, so uh, the typical site layout, and this one is, uh, uh, I would say, the minimum required equipment for a triple fluid uh, application. So uh, it can. Uh, obviously uh, uh, reduce in size and scale down in case of uh, double fluid or single fluid application, of course. So uh, the first fluid is the is the grout. So we will need a batching plant, uh, which is the one here under the silos. So we have some storage silos for the cementitious material. Uh, we have the storage for the water in the tanks and everything is mixed uh, is delivered into an agitator, which keeps the, the grout in motion. And finally, through a high pressure pump, uh, it is delivered to the rig through a dedicated line. Uh, the second um, fluid is the air. So we will need basically a, an air compressor uh, to compress the air and pump it through the second line uh, to the rig again. And finally, we have uh, the third fluid in this case, which is the water. So we will need some extra uh, storage of water and uh, a second pump in this case. Uh, to pump the water through the third line to the to the rig. Uh, as I said, we can scale it down by removing, for example, one uh, high pressure pump in case of the double fluid by removing the compressor in case we have uh, the single fluid. Uh, here you can see on the on the bottom a small pond and then a, a bigger pond for the spoil collection. We will talk about that in the next uh, slide. Uh, so, as previously uh, described uh, also by Dennis and Paolo, so the spoil is a very important aspect in the, in the Zag routing application. Uh, general rule is uh, uh, whatever goes in has to come out. So, uh, we will introduce grout and eventually air and water in the, in the ground, and we expect the same volume of uh, spoil to return. So, the spoil will be basically a mixture of uh, grout and the eroded soil, uh, which is typically collected in uh, local ponds nearby the rigs, as you can see in the picture, uh, and then delivered to some bigger storage tanks uh, located in some uh, fixed position uh, across the side. Uh, we can skip this step of the local ponds by, for example, pumping uh, the spoil directly into the storage tanks. Uh, and we will see an example. Um, on the storage tanks, then the spoil is allowed to set for a certain amount of time, a few hours, uh, probably uh, one day before it gets, uh, let's say, stackable, and you can dispose it off-site. Uh, in some other cases, the requirement is to actually treat the spoil, and the treatment uh, occurs in a fresh state. So uh, the fresh spoil is uh, conveyed to a treatment plant uh, where the solids are separated from the liquids and for further disposal or uh, reuse. So that's another option for the spoil management. Um, now we can jump into the first case history. Uh, so uh, the first one is in Washington DC is the Northeast Boundary Tunnel. Uh, uh, we as Trabiaicos worked uh, on nine uh, distinct areas installing support of excavation mainly. Uh, and we also installed about uh, 1,200 columns uh, for mainly bottom plaques and edits, so cross passes between the future tunnel and the structures. Uh, we installed uh, mostly double fluid columns 
in some cases with, uh, let's say, elliptic shape. Uh, so the first challenge I want to discuss about this project is about the site logistics. So in uh, some location, uh, the site was pretty tight and also the Zegal team was in conjunction with uh, some other activities. Uh, so in this case, to manage the spoil and keep the site clean, uh, and also because there was basically no space for having the ponds on site, we decided to install uh, a T-shaped diverter, which is the one highlighted here, uh, which basically collects the spoil uh, from inside the temporary casing and divert it to some uh, uh, storage uh, tanks or pits uh, located at a different location. So that is how we choose to manage the spoil in this location. Uh, the next challenge is about the design, is more about the design. So in one location, uh, there was a, a, an abandoned uh, TBM uh, shield left in place at the end of the, that tunneling section, and uh, it was pretty close to the future tunnel. So the requirement in this case was to treat this uh, volume of soil highlighted in green. Uh, the challenge was, apart from the TBM shield, uh, about some existing utilities that were in place, uh, active utilities. So uh, we had to avoid all these utilities, but at the same time, play all the volume of soil. So uh, we choose to use this uh, uh, semi-elliptic uh, shape for the columns. So uh, slowing down the rotation basically in one uh, sector of the column allow us to increase the diameter of that uh, sector. So by combining different shapes uh, of the elements, we were able to treat all the volume without, uh, or let's say with minimal impact on the, uh, on the existing utilities. In some cases, we had to go through the utility to install some columns. But in most of the cases, we were able to treat the volume just with the, uh, with the elliptic shape. Next, uh, um, Case history is in Sacramento this time, is a cutoff wall along the Sacramento River. So this is on the east side. Uh, we install uh, triple fluid Zagrotin columns with diameters ranging between eight and 10 and a half feet. Uh, in some cases, uh, these columns were in close proximity to uh, existing utilities like, like gas lines or uh, discharging pipes. Uh, in some other location, we were, for example, very close to some existing buildings. Uh, in general, we achieved that uh, up to about 144 feet. Uh, and the purpose of the treatment was uh, a cutoff uh, uh, of the levy in some uh, sections. So the first uh, challenge on this side, and it was more uh, like a risk mitigation was uh, on a, on, a, on a particular location where uh, a previous uh, breach in the levee occurred. So the breach was uh, basically uh, plugged uh, using uh, some uncontrolled material, uh, including large cobbles, boulders, uh, bricks, uh, and uh, some other stuff. Uh, so it was actually prescribed to use uh, some kind of uh, percussion system to drill through uh, this uh, breach field. So we choose to use a down the hole water hammer. Uh, and at the end, it turned out to be a very effective way to uh, pass through this uh, uh, bridge uh, with, I would say, minor deviation and uh, with time efficiency. Uh, the next uh, uh, item I want to talk about is again the spoil. So again, this is an important aspect. Uh, in this case, due to the shape of the uh, cutoff wall, which is basically linear. Uh, so we choose to uh, create like a, a trench, a U-shaped trench made of concrete uh, to allow the spoil to flow from the uh, zagrouting point to a submersible pump, which basically collect the spoil and pump it. And, and in some location, we pump it more than one mile away to a treatment uh, station, which is the one you can see uh, here on the top. So at this treatment station, uh, 
the, the flesh oil was a uh, uh, plated, so separating the solids from, from the liquids. And you can see the separated uh, material here in this pit for uh, final disposal. The last uh, case history I want to present is in Norway. So is the UDK02 tunnel uh, in Drammen, which is a city, let's say, about 30 minutes from Oslo. Uh, the tunnel was composed by two uh, sections. So one section was the cut and cover. Uh, so over there is basically open triangle. So we uh, used the zag routing to create a bottom plug in between uh, the sheet piles or the second piles in uh, different locations. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, the soil tunnel side, which is the one here in green. And maybe the next slide explains better. So this is a 3D model of uh, the, the treatment. So for the soil tunnel, we had two uh, different sections. One is called full phase. So we actually treated all the ring uh, of soil surrounding the tunnel. Uh, when the tunnel hits the, the bedrock, so we basically only treated the, uh, the soil above the, the rock interface, uh, creating like a vault uh, on top of the excavation. Uh, I want to talk about the field trial that we ran on this uh, on this job site. So uh, the, the, the first one we did was by installing some isolated columns uh, and with different parameters to target different uh, diameters. Uh, so in addition to the typical tests uh, that are run like coring and sampling, uh, running uh, a confined strength and permeability, we put in place some additional testing. Um, first one I want to talk about is the painted bars. Uh, so similarly to the system that Dennis presented, uh, in this case, we installed uh, two painted rods uh, at a set distance from the center of the column and we extracted them after installing the column so uh, the concept is uh, quite simple so if the if the jetting achieved that rod uh, it means that the diameter uh, is achieving that particular uh, radius uh, the other test, of course, we uh, expose the head of, of the cones just to confirm the diameter, at least in the uh, top portion of the column. And in addition to that, we also ran a seismic or soil tomography. So uh, we drill holes in between the single columns and we ran a seismic, a series of uh, seismic or soil tests in between these holes. Uh, this allowed to define the first arrival time uh, in between each hole for its testing. And finally, to create this uh, uh, tomography, which shows uh, the uh, diameter of each column along the depth. So this is, I would recommend it as a, a supplemental test in addition to the more typical tests like coring and creating clusters of columns like like what we did in the second stage. So uh, once we selected the parameters, we basically installed one cluster of columns. Uh, we uh, ran a coring at the, at the overlap. And we also ran again a seismic or soil tomography. In this case, uh, within the treatment, so we confirmed that there was no portion of untreated soil in between the holes. And we did the same for some cluster of inclined columns. So the project, uh, uh, in the design of the project, there was also some inclined columns. So we did basically the same testing, uh, running the cross uh, tomography and to see the shape of the inclined columns. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about the S-Build. Uh, so on this project, it was prescribed to have a 100% uh, S-Build of the columns. Uh, so. In, in this case, we use an uh, inclinometer uh, made of, uh, uh, an, it was basically an accelerometer array installed within the zag routing rods at the end of the trailing. So uh, that system will give you the profile of the single column with that. So it, it will basically give you the 3D position 
which you can implement in uh, in an Excel spreadsheet or uh, in even in AutoCAD if you want. Uh, so on a cluster of columns, we were able to uh, define the actual shape and, and position of each column and the one in red are the corings. So you can also see where the corings are uh, going. Uh, and we also did the same in all the production columns. So uh, here is an example. Uh, this is a sector of the, of the project uh, where we uh, basically plotted here all the as built of the columns of that sector. Uh, and these kind of as builds allow you to identify and spot some uh, areas of untreated uh, soil and target them with some, uh, uh, for example, additional columns just to plug those uh, holes, let's say. And this is a view from the bottom. So with that said, I, I jump to the end of my presentation with some conclusion, pros and cons. So uh, the main uh, positive point about the Zeg routing, I will summarize as a flexibility of the system. Uh, so uh, Zeg routing can be used as uh, Dennis was showing to improve uh, strength and permeability on a wide range of soil. So going from uh, gravels uh, to pit clays and uh, cohesive materials. Uh, also, we can obtain a, a pretty good size of the elements uh, up to 12, 15 feet, or in some cases, even more, starting uh, from a relatively small size of trail holes. So, uh, starting from a four to seven inches hole, we can create a much bigger diameter. Uh, it can be associated with uh, either percussion trailing, as we have seen in the Sacramento example or a rotary, uh, typical rotary drilling. Uh, so is also flexible in the type of uh, drilling. Uh, and also can be used, of course, using a small uh, size and lightweight rigs. Uh, it can be used to perform the zeg routing in low headroom condition. Uh, on the downside, uh, uh, of course, you need uh, is a technology that require highly experienced personnel, and they would add the uh, contractors and designers. Uh, and the other cons uh, are mostly related to the spoil again. Uh, so there is a potential risk of heave at the ground surface uh, if we don't get a constant uh, spoil flowing out, uh, or potentially there could be migration of the spoil, for example, inside utilities or in case we have buildings close by uh, basements. Um, and in general, uh, is a technology that will generate uh, a pretty good amount of spoil, so uh, needs to be planned and managed properly. Uh, of course, all these can be highly mitigated uh, by the first point. So if you have highly experienced uh, personnel and contractors, you can basically mitigate all the other downsides. Uh, so with this, I will thank you for your attention. And uh, I think we have a good amount of time for the question and answer. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, I'd like to start with Dennis. I have three questions for you, Dennis. Um, the first one is from Patrick, and please forgive me if I destroy your names, pronunciations. Um, <laughs> I'm not good at that. Um, Patrick Dernell, for designing bottom seals and coffer dams, what is the typical allowable tension stress and shear stress in a good jet grout, jet grout job in fine sands? It's a great, great question, Patrick. We kind of get asked this question many times. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, technical papers that have been written on it, but the short answer to your question, you know, tension, allowable tension stress and allowable shear stress in these low strength unreinforced materials. Of course, we got to take into consideration load combinations that we're finding, but uh, you know, we usually use a, a general uh, design guideline of 10% of the unconfined compressive strength for allowable tension, and then roughly 0.43 to about half of the 
unconfined for um, allowable uh, shear strength, right? So I hope that answers your question. Uh, also from Patrick, if sheet pile need to be removed on a bottom seal job, what level of bond stress needs to be broken to pull the sheets out of jet grout? Oh, this is a great question, Patrick. Uh, we get asked this question many times from contractors. So, you know, one of the things we got to consider is typically these bottom seals are put in before the excavation's made. And so what we what we have to consider when we're when we're pulling these sheets after the fact is breaking that bond stress, of course, but also the normal force that's on the back of those sheets, right? Because we've picked up all of that. We've picked up all of that active pressure from the soil and and whatever. So even if those sheets are backfilled, you know, you still have that load uh, back there applying that pressure to the soil crete. So just, you know, take a pile hammer or a good vibro hammer and just sit on it for a few moments and it'll 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 break loose and come on out. We've we've actually um of uh, you know popped uh uh, you know, steel beams out of jack rock columns and these kind of things using using pile hammer and vibro hammers to break them free. You know, you might damage some of the soil creed. So obviously you got to take all that into consideration, right? The vibrations that are going to be created from, from breaking that loose. So good question. Okay. And the other question is from Lakshmana Rao. How can we install the reinforcement while doing jet grouting in the same jet grouted column? So usually it's done after the fact, right? So I showed these couple of case histories when we talk about jet grouted bond zones for anchors and micro piles. It's usually done as a second secondary installation process. Um, you know, we have stuck some anchor bars into jet grouted columns after they're done. You need to really, it really depends on the soils you're in. Obviously, if you're in sands and cobbles and these kinds of things, it's going to be difficult to insert any kind of reinforcing element back into that jet grouted body because all that material has a tendency to, you know, sort of like uh, densify during the process. Clays are a little bit easier, a little bit more forgiving, but, um, you know, typically we're only putting reinforcing elements in the very top of these things. And then, and then of course, with anchors and micropiles, we're looking at a, a sort of a secondary installation process. Thank Great you. Um, Thank you. I have two questions for Paulo. Yep. Uh, one is from Brian Ursh. How did you determine the target pressure? But the target pressure is, uh, first of all, is defined by the contractor. Typically, the contractor, the, the pressure of the, uh, I presume, of the grouting, correct? That's I what I'm assuming. If, yeah. if, the, if, the, if the pressure of the jet grouting, uh, the jetting is defined by the contractor. Typically, is between, uh, I would say, three, 300 and 500 bar. Uh, it's a sort of uh, uh, what is the, the capability of the contractor, the pump that they, they have available. Uh, typically, the, the, the pump today, they are between uh, easily 300 and 600 bar without any problem. Uh, so this is a little bit the... the, the the answer. Okay. Tell me something, Next. contractor guys. <laughs> I think this is the number that we. Yes. Yeah, it's it's it, the pumps that we use today, right? Lorenzo have high horsepower, and and oh. we try to put all that horsepower in the ground when we're doing the process. Yeah, I mean, talking about pressure, probably that is the more fixed, I would say, parameter in the order of. Uh, 400 bars, what you typically place with the delivery rate, uh, more than the pressure. So around the 400 bars, I would say, is a, yeah. is a good number. Okay. Okay. Your yeah. next question is from Patrick Durnell. Does the structural evaluations of thick jet grout bottom seals include doing a strut and tie model like in concrete design? Uh, so, so I can tell you what we've used in in the past. Yeah, it's 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 typically you know it's just a compression strut, and so we, you know, we basically just 
look at the stress of, in that strut, look at the bending of it, um, any kind of buoyant forces. We're doing a complete bottom seal. You take into consideration the buoyant, buoyant, uh, you know, uh, uh, uplift of that. So you may, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that can be done. We can increase the thickness of the columns in the center of the bottom seal. Do do a bunch of sort of interesting things with the shape to minimize, you know, minimize any of these uh, high stresses. But uh, yeah, you're just, you're typically just looking at uh, designing, you know, strut beam across the base of the excavation. And it's typically just a, a little bit of, uh, you know, the allowable shear stress. You just don't want to, just don't want to get over that. So very similar, very similar set of uh, design process and, and, and parameters there. So. Okay. okay, great questions. What is the risk of damaging utilities or other structures such mm -hmm. as footings within the jet grout column? Right, Lorenzo, we all probably have stories about this, right? I can I can only tell you what uh, occurred to us over the years. So jet grouting loves PVC pipes, right? And so it, it you know, it's an erosional based uh, grouting technique and 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 if you're trying to road something that's uh, made out of plastic, it's not going to last very long. I can tell you that we we cut into some unknown utilities that uh, quickly filled up the men's restroom at uh, at the George Bush Intercontinental Airport uh, when we were doing that underpinning job. So if there's a utility that's made out of plastic, you're going to find it if you're near it. You know, steel and concrete, uh, you know, will will survive and. I don't know, you probably have your own sort of experience there that you can speak to, right, Lorenzo? Yeah, and I would say, I mean, it depends also on the distance from uh, from the jetting point. Uh, I would say that if you run a proper survey of the existing utilities, uh, at least this can be mitigated by, for example, installing single fluid columns when you are in proximity to existing utilities. So apply i would say the least possible energy and then to create something like a shield uh in between the utility and uh, the other columns which you can install with higher energy so there's always a way to mitigate this uh, of course the risk is never zero but it can be mitigated in different ways what is the typical procedure for overlapping columns without disturbing too large an area, especially for underpinning applications? And can overlapping columns erode a fully cured column? No, uh, I can answer, but uh, typically if we do a sequence, uh, uh, not fresh on fresh, but primary, secondary, tertiary, a, a typical uh, a space split method, uh, uh, there will be depending from the time when we do the secondary column, but uh, typically there is not uh, uh, some erosion. Uh, as you see in the in the in the um, in the slide that I show in John Hard Dam, uh, the co the second column was a little bit uh, uh, smaller than the previous one. Seems that there was not quite uh, erosion in the previously done column. Um, so typically, I don't think there is quite uh, a big erosion. It depends on the compressive strength of the material, of course, and the crowd mix used depends on all these uh, this, this factor and parameter. Okay, thank you. Please explain how the air or water plus grout make their way through the drill stem casing and into the column. How does the water used for jetting not compromise the grout? The water used for jetting. This, for example, is the, the spoil is the, when we create the column, when we apply the high pressure, the spoil is coming in the annular space between the rod and the, and the, and the, and the, and the soil and the previously drilled. And this is the reason why in John Hardam, we use the uh, casing, the PVC casing. So in this way, the annular space between the soil and the rod was always open, but there is no contamination. It means uh, water, water cement, it means if there is, 
in the sand or in the in the material there is some water uh, yes there will be some contamination definitely and this is the reason why we do the field test uh, to define if there is some um, decreasing of the compression strength or what will be the final compression strength this is my personal answer yeah i think um right lorenzo to this question so the drill rods are co-centric so so if we have like triple fluid right which i think your question is leaning towards where we're using water for the erosion medium so we'll have two additional uh inner drill rods inside the main casing right so the drill rod in the center usually carries the high pressure fluid the second annular space in the drill rod carries the engineered grout material to the monitor and then that last annular space in that in that concentric set of drill rods inside the casing carries the air right and so and so those things enter the drill steel at the top of the drill string through a swivel and so those swivels you know and that's how you can tell what kind of system we're using for check routing unless we're doing some some super jetting we'll have three hoses connected to that swivel. One's carrying our high pressure water, one's carrying the slurry grout, one's carrying the air. And then at the base of the drill rod, we have that monitor that I showed at the beginning. And so that monitor takes those, those other chambers included in that drill rod, brings everything together and it exits, it exits that nozzle. Now when we're doing triple system where we're using that water for erosion, that water jet is some distance above the grouting jets where we're backfilling and mixing that column up with the engineered grout. So it does a pretty good job of not diluting that that grout that's being placed in that structural part of the column. Maybe, maybe Lorenzo, you have a bit more explanation of this. No, right? no, no, that, that's it. I mean, all the fluids uh, stay separated until they get south on the monitor. And as you said, in the triple fluid, uh, we have the water nozzle above the uh, grout and their nozzle. So basically, the grout push uh, from the bottom, push up the, the water from the bottom, so that will prevent most of the mixing. And I think I think you both have answered the next question, which is how are the spoils removed from the column? The drill stem casing has a separate opening to suck it out, which is it's basically uh, returned up the annular space. Yeah, yeah. So 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 to really expand on what uh, Paolo was saying there, uh, Kathleen. So the drill, the drill string, at the end of the drill string, we have a typical bit, right? Depends on what we're drilling in. And that bit is typically oversized to create an annular space that's usually around a half inch around the drill rod. So when we fire up that jet routing, so all of that fluid, the volume that we're putting in the ground has to come out. And it comes out through that annular space created by that oversized drilling bit, creating the annulus around that right. that outside diameter of the drill casing we're using to do the jet routing. If that plugs up, <laughs> all that pressure is going to fire fire really? on that ground. And like Paolo really? mentioned, right, the last thing you want to do is have that happen in a very sensitive structure because it it creates all kinds of issues in the ground for us. And this is particularly different in cohesive material, of course. Yes. Right. In clay, clay, seed clay, we can have some trouble sometimes, definitely. Yeah, we come up with all kinds of like very creative ways Absolutely. to get yeah. oil out of the ground when we're dealing with cohesive soils. It's just exactly. it's just a different animal, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because exactly. cement, cement and clay, cement and clay don't like each other. So when you're jetting in. When you're jetting in those clay materials, that, that that cement has a tendency to ball that clay up, and it's it's very difficult to get out of the, get out of the ground. When we're doing jet crying. so so make sure you take care. Exactly. Exactly. Next question is: What is a good dollar per cubic yard number to make preliminary estimates on bottom seal applications? <laughs> Lorenzo's been waiting for this question all morning long. So I'm going to pick this this question. <laughs> No, I, I would say it really depends on many things, and uh, I would say location and cost of the material, cost of the personnel. Uh, it really depends. And my recommendation is ask for a quote uh, because it really depends on several aspects. And giving a range, I don't think will give uh, any guidance here. Okay. 
Can can these jet grout walls be used in offshore mud levels to improve turbine foundations? By the way, excellent and clear cut presentation. Thank you. Um, so I'll repeat. Do you want me to repeat yeah, that it, question? It, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it, it, I, I think that application would probably be best served by some other method, but um, um, sure. I mean, there's no reason why it couldn't be. It's just a matter of do the economics work for you, right? I know if the, if the foundations that we do, you know, on dry land for wind turbines, you know, that I know they're always looking for, you know, the most cost effective solution. And so if I was to carry that into a marine environment for the offshore application, it might not be the best cost effective solution, but yeah, why not? I'm sure we could use it, right? Have you guys ever done any of that, Lorenzo? Uh, we did some near shore application. It was not for a wind turbine, but we did some uh, zagrouting from, from barge. Uh, of course, you need to contain the spoil because it still comes out at the at the river bed. In that That's example, true. so uh, you need to create like a coffer dam in that mm -hmm. case to contain the spoil, manage it properly, uh, and yeah, is is feasible. I would say it again depends on the the context of the project. Yeah, it's all spoil management and uh, environmental problem uh, that. Can be solved, I think, uh, in one way or the other, always because jet routing is the most flexible technology that we have. Exactly, <laughs> so money, right, money. Pal? <laughs> <laughs> like Johnny Mandel used to say, exactly. "Show me the money." Exactly, 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 <laughs> Dennis. Exactly. <laughs> Next question is directed to Dennis. Is there any trend in the future to use new materials to reduce the amount of cement? Oh, 100 percent. I mean. You know, we we have so and I'm sure and I'm sure, Lorenzo, you guys have this at Trevi as well. Right. Yeah. Within our company, we have we have a jet. We have a global jet route product team that does. I mean, this is one of their big uh, pushes by our board at Keller is to reduce, you know, our carbon footprint and, and be good stewards of our environment. And the best way to do that is. Is two things reduce the amount of fuel we consume on our site so we're looking at electric uh, power jet routing equipment to pumps and all these things so that's one way to do it the other side is the reduction of cement through uh, alternate binders uh, there's there's blast furnace slag which you know there's there's fly ash there's 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 lime crushings there's all kinds of uh, various uh, sort of like admixtures and and alternate binders that we're now testing right to reduce the overall uh, carbon demand of 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 jet routing right um, this is directed for all speakers do you have any rules of thumb for jetting energies to produce certain column sizes in various soils i.e dense sands silty um, stiff silty clays so I did have the the one graphic in my section where we talk about this. So, uh, you know, you know, reasonable column diameters and different different soil types. But I think like we've all shown here today, right? I mean, the column diameter should be evaluated in a field test program uh, just to confirm, you know, to confirm that before you go into you know some massive production thing. Now, obviously, right? Like Paolo said. Uh, you know, in emergency jobs and these kind of things, we can just use very conservative parameters. But uh, yeah, a good place to start is uh, that uh, that one slide that I had in my presentation. I, I I don't remember Lorenzo about your presentation if you had any sort of relationship between erosion energy and and diameter uh, of these columns. No, right? no, I, I didn't show it in my presentation. I mean, the, there is some literature on that, giving some yes. hands and. Sometimes it's based on actually the experience of the company in similar condition. So based on that, you can like target your field trial with some average uh, parameters and then plus minus, let's say 20% to create different clusters of columns with different parameters. So you can define a range of parameter and target what you will need to do in the production. And that's the reason why we have the field trials in the, the Zagrouting. 
uh, because there's not a, a certain answer from the beginning. Everything must be validated through a test section. How can one assure corrosion protection of the reinforcement in a jet grout anchor or tensile element? Yeah, you can just follow, you know, you can follow PTI recommendations here, right? You can, you know, you can doubly corrosion protect the element. You can epoxy coat it uh, because, like I said, that element typically is going to go in as a secondary installation uh, procedure to creating the jet grouted bond zone. I Lorenzo, do you have some? Oh, uh, that's different it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah. yeah, here in Vancouver, we are using quite a lot uh, um, H H pile, H steel pile, embedded in uh, in column also 15, 18 meter deep. It's... Okay, um, and I'm watching. We have about five minutes left, um, and we have a few more questions to go through. Great also, question. how is the lateral <laughs> resistance strength compared to other and contemporary eight. methods like diaphragm wall sheet piles? Ah, uh, so it all comes down to you know allowable stresses in the columns, right? So just to kind of a rule of thumb, um, you know, when we're underpinning structures, so to speak, um, you know, you're picking up that normal force of the structure pushing down on the body of, of soil creep. So you know, you can you can take advantage of that in the stress calculation, but you're only held to you know ten percent of a very low unconfined compressive strength for tensile capacity, right? So, you know, ultimately you're going to end up having to put some reinforcement in it because that body gets bigger and bigger and bigger to take that to take that load, and that's really not cost effective to do. So, we're dealing with strengths that are two to three hundred psi versus diaphragm walls, which are heavily reinforced and thousands of PSI, you know, quality concrete, right, Lorenzo? Yeah, I would say that. The comparison with the slurry wall is mostly about the strength of the material. Yeah. Instead of introducing concrete, you kind of have a 100, 200 PSI material. So probably if you have just one alignment uh, to support your excavation, you will need uh, reinforcement, as Danny said. Okay. For Paula, regarding the sampling frequency of the spoil to evaluate the compressive strength, what recommendation is there? How many test specimens per cubic meter or how many per day? This uh, depends uh, from uh, the uh, extension of the job site. can be done uh, in, if, if you have, for example, uh, different, a different layer. We can have, uh, uh, I did some project in here in, in, in British Columbia, when we change parameter, for example, we had some uh, um, silty, silty sand material, we had sand material. So typically, um, I would say every 30, 40 column, but depend from the from the extension. We can follow the the, the, the some some uh, uh, standard that we have done for the for the concrete, for example, something like that. I don't have the number in my head. How would you grout under the building foundation other than incline jetting? So, so I think, you know, Lorenzo did a really good job in this section of his presentation, right? I mean, you know, just like all these structures, you know, I can think of the, uh, I can think of the Brooklyn bridge. I can think of all these things that you've done there as well. And Trevi, right. We just, we try to underpin a lot of the structure with with a column, and then and then once we have those columns, we space them out. You know, we can leave we call them slots when we're underpinning structures. You know, we put in some primary columns, and then when we do those secondary columns, we can use like you know this step step turn or produce an elliptical element where the body of that ellipse you know goes pretty far up underneath there if we've got to grab more of that footing. So I think this kind of answers the next couple of questions. As well, Kathleen, but it's all it's all about sequencing. So the primary elements are the ones that you really got to be careful with because you know, especially some of these structures. So you get those primary elements underneath there, you're monitoring the structure for settlement during that. And then once you have the foot, you know, that structure sitting on top of that jet route, then you can start putting in bigger elements of secondary elements and grab more of that footing. So 
I hope that answers these next couple. And and feel free to chime in there, Lorenzo. Right? No, no, no. I mean, uh, that's the concept, and uh, especially when you want to use big uh, columns to underpin, you you must also consider that in the meantime, while this uh, while the material is still fresh, uh, so basically it will not carry any load. So uh, must you must follow uh, find a balance in between using wide element to tighten all the volume underneath the footing, for example, and not, let's say, loosen too much volume of soil underneath that, that footing, because while it's still fresh, it cannot carry any load. Yeah. Okay, so so with that, um, I'd like to conclude the question answer time. And if we could put up the slides for the, um, contact information where, because there was a question as far as receiving a copy of the um, the presentations. And um, first of all, you can get your PDA certificates available after paid registrants complete the webinar evaluation. Um, the following email that's provided, www.dfi.org, uh, that's where you can have the access instructions for your certificates. And um, it's also at this site that you can get a copy of the presentations. And I believe it will take, I forget how long they told me, a few days or so for that to be posted. And um, any problems you have with that, you can direct questions to the following tech activities at dfi.org. Um, the International Grouting Committee will be um, we will be putting on another webinar in December. Um, I'm going to say a tentative date of December 10th. Uh, there will be announcements that will come out on that later and also on the subject matter. We appreciate everybody's time. We appreciate our speakers. Thank you so much for your presentations and your time. And hopefully we'll see you on our next webinar. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe yeah. out there. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Denise, Lorenzo. Thank you, Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Bye-bye. Have a great day.